the last uh, cannabis convention that I, I organized. And uh, I'm just so thankful for all the work and support that, that Chris has uh, put into to his work and, and helping me uh, through mine. But uh, for personal reasons, as, as many in the room know, uh, my girlfriend is, is you know, hopefully not soon, but she is dying of cancer. And uh, I've been doing this work for, for 19 years, and uh, I'm pretty much at the end of my rope. And so I have a few more meetings to, to organize. I'm doing a rally in Ottawa on April 1st, and uh, April 20th is likely going to be the last event that I'm I'm organizing. I've put together about 3,500 conventions, lectures, rallies, and such. And I'm so thankful to see, you know, the, the efforts being put in. And today, uh, with Corbin here and, and the school, and, and Jeremiah and, and Chris and so many other good people working in this field, that I, I can walk away with my head up, knowing that it will become legal and that I have had a part in that. Uh, but uh, this is uh, nearing the, the end of, of my work. Um, I'll put in another plug for the petition that's at the back of the room. There's a couple things back here. We have a petition for the Municipal Cannabis Partners. There's an oxygen machine. We're going to go a little bit late here, past four, till about ten after, to give Jeremiah some more time to speak. And uh, that, the 420 will probably be delayed a little bit as well for the raffle, but we are doing a raffle at the end. I got so many prizes, pretty much everybody here will walk away with something if you buy a ticket, so it would be nice to get some support for that. Um, and I'll give a little plug at the end again. But uh, Chris is leaving here, so I wanted to, again, just thank him for all the years of, of support that he's given to me. And uh, I just can't say thank you. Thank you for everything you've done, Ted. Uh, uh, our final speaker here today, uh, Jeremiah Vandermeer, is, uh, again, one of the reasons why I feel I can walk away and things are moving ahead. His work at Pot TV and that cannabis culture is really you know, leading the world in uh, teaching people about what's happening with this movement. And uh, we're about to get a 40 minute blast of what is happening around the world in, in ways that many of us may not even be aware of that work in this field. And so I really appreciate Jeremiah uh, coming up here today with this presentation as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Now, just set this all up properly here. I also have a video, so uh, I'll play that towards the end of hoping the sound will be okay. Okay. Uh, well, hello there, Anthology 101ers. Okay. So, all right. Well, it's uh, a very exciting time to be a marijuana activist in North America, that's for sure. Um, the movement and prohibition of legalized marijuana has taken some pretty huge strides in the last year, well, since the beginning of 2013. And uh, I'm going to go through, well, I was going to say, uh, it's been, we've come a long way since it was just those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not actually sure who those guys are, but that picture is always, it looks like it's from the 60s or something. Um, it's, I'm going to go over a few of our big wins uh, that we've had in the past year, and then discuss some major issues that I think we still need to work on. Um, before we can really achieve what some of us like to think of as drug peace. So, let's see here. Right, um, 2013 really was off the hook in a lot of different ways, and one of the big major things that we hadn't seen before was uh, the U.S. polling showing them that a majority want legalization in the United States. So in October of 2013, for the first time, a clear majority of Americans told Gallup that they wanted to legalize marijuana. Um, scientific polling done by Gallup 58% responded yes to the question, do you think the use of marijuana should be made simple or not? That's the first time um, that's happened um, in such large numbers. It's a sharp contrast to the first time Gallup asked the question in 69, when 12% favored legalization. So, um, in Canada, it's a little bit better. 69% of people want it legalized or decriminalized according to the most recent polls. So. Um, we have a lot of increased support that's happening. It's continuing, probably some of it because of the massive wins in Colorado and Washington, which have been getting an unparalleled amount of media attention all over the place. Um, November 2012, here, let's go on there, yes. So in November, Colorado and Washington both voted to legalize the possession of marijuana under an ounce. Uh, Colorado, you can actually grow six plants, uh, personal cultivation, and that's for adults 21 and over. Uh, retail establishments are already open in Colorado now. 
uh, as of January 14, 2014. In that month alone, they sold more than $14 million worth of pot, <laughs> recreational pot that is, and uh, raked in about $2 million from taxes. And uh, they're expected to generate over $100 million a year. Uh, and that's just their sort of conservative estimate. It'll probably, it'll probably end up being more than that. This is people standing outside of the one of the Colorado shops on opening day in the snow. <laughs> oh, right. Okay, so well, I was going to say, um, though these new policies were decided by state voters in those states, it really couldn't have been done, and legalization could not have happened without help from, of course, the Chum Gang, the federal government, that's Mr. Obama um, in his days, back in the day when he was, I guess, a smoker. Uh, that's supposed to be a cigarette, they claim, but it looks like he's choking up on it a lot there. Uh, on August 29th, the Obama administration released a memorandum uh, for all U.S. attorneys, essentially instructing them to not interfere with state-compliant legalization systems, so and not to prosecute those licensed to produce or sell the plant in the states, as long as they don't sell to minors, don't ship the product out of state, and follow the other few guidelines. Um, that memo effectively made state legalization possible. In November, uh, the Obama administration offered a forceful critique of mass incarceration policies in the United States. So this is something they hadn't really done before either. Attorney General uh, Eric Holder, speaking at a security minister's meeting in Colombia, said, the path we are currently on is far from sustainable. As we speak, roughly one out of every 100 adults is behind bars. Although the United States comprises just 5% of the world's population, we incarcerate almost a quarter of the world's prisoners. While few would dispute the fact that incarceration has a role to play in any comprehensive public safety strategy, it's become evident that such widespread incarceration is both inadvisable and unsustainable. It requires that we routinely spend billions of dollars on prison construction and tens of billions more on, annual, on an annual basis to house those who are convicted of crimes. It carries both human and moral costs that are too much to bear and it results in far too many Americans serving too much time in too many prisons and beyond the point of serving any good law enforcement reason. So that's the Attorney General. It's pretty remarkable to hear that. Um, so then, in February of 2014, just last month, the Obama administration cleared the way for the banking industry to legally do business with state marijuana dealers. Um, according to the Washington Post, for the first time, legal distributors will be able to secure loans and set up checking and savings accounts with major banks that have largely steered clear of those businesses, eliminating a key hurdle facing marijuana sellers. So that's big. It's big time. Now, and also in February, at the same time, just right around the same day, Obama signed the 2014 Agricultural Act, which includes a new provision making it legal under federal law for universities and state agriculture departments to grow and research hemp and its industrial properties without penalty in states where hemp's legal. In Colorado, which legalized hemp. So there's hemp legalization. So Obama is becoming the marijuana president uh, that they, we weren't quite sure he was going to become at the end of his first term. Um, and on the hemp thing, according to the Denver Post, Colorado farmer Ryan Laughlin made history in November 2013 by harvesting the nation's first commercial hemp crop in over 56 years, or in 56 years just about six years. Um, and then just a few days ago, the Obama administration, it was just over a week ago, um, the, the LA Times reported that the Obama administration handed backers of medical marijuana a significant victory on Friday, opening the way for a University of Arizona researcher to examine whether pot can help veterans cope with post-traumatic stress, a move that could lead to broader studies into potential benefits of the drug. According to the Times, government officials said the approval did not represent a change in their underlying policy, just a recognition that the proposal meets official standards for research using illegal drugs. Uh, the research still requires the approval of the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, but we'll see how they treat it. Yeah. But according to the researchers, they think it's much less of a hurdle to get approved the DEA. But we'll see. DEA is not very friendly still. Uh -huh. All right. So on the medical side of things, um, this has been another profitable year. Just really a lot of great things happening. Um, 20 states and Washington, D.C. have now legalized or effectively decriminalized medical marijuana, starting with California in 1996. And this year, we saw some major breakthroughs in marijuana research and how MedPot laws are enforced. And I have a list of seven major ones from Leaf Science, which
which is an awesome website if you're looking for cool scientific stuff about pot. Um, the FDA approved the first clinical trials using marijuana for epilepsy. Research came out that showed marijuana actually kills leukemia, so that's a big one. Um, there, the first clinical trials using marijuana for brain cancer happened. Research showing marijuana helps smokers quit tobacco came out this year. Research finding clinical evidence that marijuana helps people with Crohn's disease. Some really good evidence of that. Um, more research finding that clinical evidence that marijuana helps Parkinson's disease. And a Harvard study finding smoking marijuana makes you thinner and less prone to diabetes. And that was one that got a lot of media attention. <laughs> um, and in August of 2013, chief medical correspondent for CNN, Sanjay Gupta, who was asked by Obama actually to be his Surgeon General, but turned it down, um, wrote a column titled, Why I Changed My Mind on Weed. And uh, Sanjay, as the CNN chief medical correspondent, had in the past kind of poo-pooed the whole marijuana, medical marijuana idea, saying that he didn't think it was something good. He had written a column and said that why he didn't support the legalization of it. So this was his apology. This is his quote. I apologize because I didn't look hard enough until now. I didn't look far enough. I didn't review papers from smaller labs in other countries doing some remarkable, or so, sorry, some remarkable research, and I was too dismissive of the loud chorus of legitimate patients whose symptoms improved on cannabis. Instead, I lumped them with the high visibility maligners, just looking to get high. I mistakenly believed the Drug Enforcement Agency listed marijuana as a Schedule One substance because of sound scientific proof. Surely they must have quality reasoning as to why marijuana in the category of the most, why it's in the most category of the most dangerous drug that have no acceptable medical use and a high potential for abuse. In order to be Schedule One, you can't have any medical benefits. So that's where it still sits. Um, he's still, still quoting here. They didn't have the science to support that claim. And I now know that when it comes to marijuana, neither of those things are true. It doesn't have a high potential for abuse and there are very legitimate medical applications. In fact, sometimes marijuana is the only thing that works. So that's great to hear, Sanjay. And it, it just unleashed the floodgates for the medical marijuana thing in the United States when CNN did that. Um, it was also uh, in line with a documentary film that Sanjay released at the same time, obviously good publicity, called Weed. And he's done a second one now. Um, and he says, this month he released a follow-up to the documentary and he wrote that, I'm more convinced than ever that it's irresponsible to not provide the best care we, we can, care that often may involve marijuana. I'm not backing down on medical marijuana, I'm doubling down. So that's pretty awesome to hear him say that. Uh, and in 2013, scientific polling indicated that over 80% of Americans think medical marijuana should be legalized. So there's no more question. That's the medical front. Now, the decriminalization front, there's an overcrowded prison for you in California. Um, there's 16 states now across the United States, and of, as of this month, Washington, D.C., that have decriminalized marijuana. So D.C., I guess, I'm not sure if, they, if it's actually been signed yet or not, but it's expected to be signed. Um, that means they've removed criminal penalties for marijuana, in some places completely removing them, and in some replacing them with things like fines. So there's also various cities across the United States that have decriminalized, um, including this year Portland, Maine, and Michigan towns Lansing, Ferndale, and Jackson um, voted in November of 2013 to decriminalize. So there's good stuff happening there too. Now, uh, a little further down in the Americas, Uruguay officially became the first country to le fully legalize marijuana in December of 2013. That's a big first step. Um, the president of the South American nation is 78-year-old Jose Pepe Mojica, uh, a former leftist guerrilla who spent 14 years in prison, many of them in solitary confinement, before he was given amnesty and released. Um, he was the main guy behind the push down there, and he had this to say, someone has to start revealing the taboos with regards to marijuana in Latin America. There are so many taboos to break. Uruguay, because it's a small country, can do it. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but if I am, give me another solution, because prohibitionist, prohibitionist policy failed, and we have been repressed for 50 years, and look at how Mexico is. Um, though he's got a strong pro-legalization stance, he's never actually tried marijuana himself, he says, but he said this about it, I have to rejuvenate my neurons and realize what kind of life young people are living. 
he told his interviewer, drug consumption is right there around the corner. So um, it's not just Latin America and uh, the U.S. having all the fun, though, because here in Canada, there's been some, some good stuff happening in the past year. Here, there. <laughs> Um, the Liberal leader, Justin Trudeau, came out in a blaze this year, um, not only admitting to smoking pot, but also completely supporting outright legalization for all members of society. Uh, that's the first time that a, a leader of a major party in Canada has done something like that and fully supports legalization rather than just decriminalization, which unfortunately our other party, the NDP, um, is still on the wagon of the decriminalization wagon. They're becoming less scientific by the minute with their arguments. Um, the Liberals seem to be going further than just paying lip service to the issue as well. The party has passed a major policy paper that suggests all kinds of good stuff in it, including things like opening marijuana stores across Canada. And the, the policy paper, if you haven't read it, is amazing. You guys should check it out. It's totally awesome. Um, it's, it's pretty, you know, if, if Justin gets in, there's a very good chance that the party and other people will get behind this. So we're supporting him. I'm supporting him this year. Um, here's a quote from Justin. He said, the, the fact of the matter is our current approach on marijuana, the prohibition that Stephen Harper continues to defend, is failing in two primary ways. The first one is it's not protecting our kids from the negative impacts of marijuana on the developing brain. So got to throw that in there. Um, secondly, we are funneling millions upon millions of dollars each year into organized crime and criminal gangs. We do not need to be funding those organizations. And, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So, uh, unfortunately, while these, uh, these great things are being talked about, we have a federal government who is reverting into the opposite direction, as obviously many of you know here, they have uh, introduced the Marijuana for Medical Purposes regulations to replace the Marijuana Medical Access regulations. And the new regulations, um, which were introduced around the beginning of 2013, um, include an outright ban on home, home cultivation by patients or designated growers, and also the establishment of a commercial production and distribution system, a mail order system. Um, and they basically, the government would grant a limited number of businesses licenses to produce. They would do it in large factories and distribute by mail across Canada to patients. Of course, limiting the um, number of strains and the increasing the, by a lot the amount of money it's going to cost patients for their supplies. It's really unwinnable for many people and not workable at all. Um, the authorities claim the new system is necessary due to the many dangers of growing marijuana at home, including fires and mold and I guess stubbing your toe or something. Um, yeah, and uh, unfortunately, the vocal groups of firefighters and police chiefs in places like Surrey uh, haven't actually really given us much evidence to back up any of their claims, uh, but they are still spouting off all of these things quite loudly. And it's being considered, of course, by Health Canada and the government cronies. Um, in November, Health Canada blamed an administrative error when the agency mailed out 40,000 letters across the country that expose people as medical marijuana users. It included the marijuana thing right on it. Um, they're now being sued, the government, in a class action lawsuit that's ongoing right now. And actually there's some really good news from that. Um, well, to add injury, insult to injury, as the case uh, has been getting started over the past little while, the federal government argued that the people who filed the class action lawsuit should have to actually use their real names in filing the lawsuit which is just completely, obviously ridiculous. The judge thought so as well, ruled against the federal government, saying that identifying them as patients would again be disclosing their personal health information. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, the government is missing something there. So, um, on March 14th, Health Canada issued a press release indicating to medical marijuana growers that they are now legally obliged to send Health Canada a letter saying that they've destroyed all of their stock of marijuana they have on hand, and also, all of their plants that are growing with kitty litter or other things, send a letter verifying that. Or Health Canada would notify the local authorities and send the RCMP after them. Very nice of them. Um, anybody who didn't comply, they would have the RCMP on their ass, according to their press release. And uh, the press release starts with the line, Health Canada does not endorse the use of marijuana. So obviously you can see how much respect they have for this medicine being used by thousands of patients across Canada. 
so as things were looking very grim last week, uh, a shining light came down from John Conroy's office and the team of the uh, Coalition Against Repeal, uh, the MMAR. And there's a lot of activists who have been working very hard on a court case to try and stop all this from happening. Um, John Conroy won the first battle against the new system in court when a judge granted a temporary injunction against, well, basically to preserve the status quo um, until a constitutional challenge on this matter can happen, goes to trial. Um, that means patients who currently hold licenses to grow can continue to grow until the trial is over uh, and the new whatever happens in the trial takes effect. We talked a little bit about that before. Um, that decision is obviously a huge blow to the conservatives and their new commercial marijuana plans. Oh man, they must be so pissed off right now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens next, as the case will likely extend into the next federal, federal election. So this could be a thorn in the side of Harper's re-election campaign. That's what it is. So good stuff happening there. Now, uh, lots of good things in North America happening, but there's still a long, long way to go. Um, unfortunately, we're—I mean—we're moving forward with so many reforms to marijuana laws here in North America. But harder drugs like cocaine and heroin, of course, remain very illegal in the United States, and it doesn't look like there's anything on the horizon to uh, work on legalizing those in any real regard. The, the illegal market um, provides massive profit-making opportunities, obviously, for the criminal gangs who run it all, and who are willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with government forces who fight them, or who are connected enough to make deals with the right government officials the right high-ranking government officials, usually somewhere in the DEA's office or the CIA. Um, so I wanted just quickly to go over a few little facts here about the Mexican drug war. There's approximately 6,700 licensed firearm dealers on the U.S.-Mexico border, all across the border. There's only one legal firearms retailer in all of Mexico. Um, nearly 70% of guns recovered from Mexico, Mexican criminal activity are traced back to U.S. sources. And that's from 2007 to 2011. And they all originate within the United States. Um, and 90% of the cocaine that enters the US transits through Mexico. So everything that comes from anywhere else in South America is coming through Mexico if it's not from there. Um, Mexico is also a main supplier of marijuana and methamphetamine in the United States. So meth and pot, still a big market for these guys too. Um, Mexican drug cartels take in between 19 and 29 billion annually from drug sales in the United States. And by the end of Felipe Calderon, the former president of Mexico, uh, 2006 to 2012, the official death toll of the Mexican drug war was at least 60,000, although unconfirmed accounts set the homicide rate probably above 100,000 because of all the just disappearances that happen. They can't really prove that they've been murdered, they just aren't around anymore. Um, so, yes, for the last 40 years, various secret deals between the U.S. government and its agencies and drug cartels have been made public. There's been a bunch of different ones. Um, we had the Iran-Contra scandal, which was a secret arrangement made in the 80s to provide funds to the Nicaraguan Contra rebels uh, who were fighting the Sandinistas at the time, and they were generating profits by selling the arms to Iran was a U.S. enemy who had hostages at the time, and by selling cocaine with the help of the CIA in the United States. Um, there's some really great reporting done on this issue by a journalist named Gary Webb, who worked for the San Jose Mercury News. Um, he's got a book called Dark Alliance, and that was also the name of the, the series um, of articles. He reported that the Nicaraguan drug traffickers in the 1980s sold and distributed crack cocaine in Los Angeles and the profits were used to fund CIA-supported Nicaraguan Contras. Uh, Webb never actually said the CIA directly aided the drug dealers, but he did document that the agency was well aware of the cocaine transactions and the large shipment of drugs into the United States by the Contras and their affiliates, making things possible for American dealers like Freeway Ricky Ross, who was basically handed over a bunch of really, really cheap cocaine to develop crack and push that out through the hood. Um, he was known as the Walmart of crack, Freeway Ricky Ross, and he made literally billions and billions of dollars pushing the stuff over a short period of time in the 80s um, across cities all, all over the U.S. They had drive, basically walkthroughs where they would just open up a house, you would walk up to the window and you could get crack and they had them all over the place. 
Um, there's been former DEA agents and other whistleblowers who have come forward. One of them named Celerino Castile III. He was uh, a DEA special agent who went public with many dirty details in a book he wrote called Powder Burns. Um, and he talks about himself refueling CIA cargo planes filled with cocaine for delivery to the United States. Um, he was an international drug warrior soldier who fought for the DEA, um, helping, basically um, helping what was happening in Nicaragua and, and other places like El Salvador. Um, he, he saw all kinds of horrific things happen, um, and a lot of them in support of President Ronald Reagan and Oliver North uh, in the, in the uh, Iran-Contra scandal by helping those Contras. Interestingly, Castillo said he once directly spoke with George H.W. Bush, the former president and former director of the CIA, of course, uh, in Guatemala in 1986, and he apparently told Bush that he'd gathered intelligence himself about U.S. involvement in drug trafficking in El Salvador and started to explain it to him. Well, Bush just shook his hand, smiled, and walked, turned around and walked right away. And didn't say else. He said, it was then and there that I knew my government knew that these atrocities were occurring. So I have a video here. That was just a little bit of the backstory, um, and I'm gonna, I wanted to play this video, which is an older clip from '99, I believe. The sound might be a little low, so I'm gonna move this over here. Sorry. 